Good morning, eighth grade students. <clears throat> we are continuing our reading of The Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, which is a true story about men who during uh, the war were striving to save some of the world's most valuable art pieces, art treasures, paintings, sculptures, um, iconic, if you will, um, artifacts uh, from cathedrals and uh, museums in Europe. And we are beginning today on chapter chapter six, page 73, and the title of the chapter is Objectives, and it's in Paris, France, late August to September 1944. And we left um, this yesterday, the last sentence, he then wandered off again, and they're talking about Keller, he then wandered off again looking for a unit with a field radio he had to make an emergency call. The convoy of Allied troops lumbered into the outskirts of Paris, the City of Light, on August 25th, snaking around barricades and an occasional burning vehicle. Sporadic gunfire crackled along the route. After four years of Nazi tyranny, the day of liberation had arrived and Monuments man Jim Rohmer, part of the advance team entering the city, was in the thick of it. German forces were fighting a desperate retreat everywhere. On the Eastern Front, the Soviets routed another Wehrmacht Army group, 500,000 soldiers in Ukraine and Eastern Poland. While the Germans weren't hemorrhaging as much territory in Western Europe, the loss of Paris was a symbolic blow. German General Dietrich von Scholtitz had surrendered his forces just hours earlier, but danger still lurked. Enemy snipers crouched in their hiding places, taking aim at the approaching military vehicles and curious civilians emerging to feel freedom once again. Romer could see signs of the fight for the city everywhere, including pickets and barbed wire on the streets, sandbag barricades in front of buildings, abandoned tanks, and other military vehicles scattered about, smoldering embers of fires recently extinguished, and German artillery pieces still warm to the touch. After spending the night in a hotel room that some German officer had occupied just 24 hours earlier, Wormer put on his chocolate OD shirt, which was really dark green in color, fastened the buckles on his once brown suede combat boots, grabbed his garrison cap, and walked across the Tuileries Gardens to the cultural heart of the city, the Louvre Museum. Second Lieutenant and former museum curator Jim Wormer knew practically every inch of the Louvre, once one of the largest and most frequently visited art museums in the world. The paintings and sculpture that covered the walls and filled its rooms were as recognizable to him as his oldest friends, but that was a different time. War had a way of making familiar ground feel unfamiliar. An unsettling silence had replaced the hustle and bustle of tourists. As rumors ascended the grand entry stairwell, he was shocked by the absence of one of the Louvre's signature pieces a work that for decades had towered over all who climbed the step, the winged victory of Samothrace, a second century BCE Greek sculpture. At the top of the staircase, he turned right, then right again into the main gallery. The paintings were also gone. In their place, someone <clears throat> had written, handwritten in chalk, the names of artists and inventory numbers of their work. The Louvre, was empty. No visitors, no works of art, just a lone monuments man armed with dozens of questions, striding with purpose. Roma always walked with purpose down the grand gallery of the museum on his way to an appointment. 
As he approached the museum's offices, Romer glanced out the window. U.S. Army soldiers were herding hundreds of German prisoners into the courtyard. In the distance, more GIs were positioning aircraft guns around the perimeter. Nothing about this visit to the Louvre was normal until he rounded a corner and saw Jacques Jouard, director of the National Museum of France. Being in the Louvre with a val valued colleague provided a brief but welcome return to the world of normal. Romer admired Jajard for helping museum colleagues in Madrid relocate to Switzerland, art masterpieces at risk of being damaged during the Spanish Civil War. Jajard's role in protecting the Louvre treasures bordered on magical. How he had done it was a mystery Romer wanted his friend to explain. The experience in Spain contributed, Jajard said, but it was advanced planning that won the day. Rorma leaned forward in his chair, like a young boy, eager to hear a great tale. When the Louvre, like other museums across Western Europe, closed in late August 1939, staff and volunteers worked around the clock to protest France's cultural heritage, to protect, excuse me, France's cultural heritage. Paintings, drawings, sculpture, and other precious objects requiring 37 convoys of five to eight trucks each were taken to the countryside chateau. Vast quantities of centuries old stained glass were removed from cathedrals in Paris and other cities then packed and stored. The concern at that stage was getting everything to the countryside to protect it from bombing and the consequent fires. Rormer, having walked through the ruins of fire damaged cities in Normandy, recognized all too well what would have happened to the Louvre treasures had Paris suffered the same fate. Knowing the winged victory of Samothrace weighed several tons, so several tons, so one ton is 2,000 pounds. So 2,000 pounds is one ton. Several tons would then be, right, 6,000 pounds. So knowing that the Wing Victory of Samothrace weighed several tons and contrary to appearances was not one solid piece of marble, but thousands of shards painstakingly reassembled. Romer was eager to, eager to learn how Jajard and his team moved it down the stairwell. Simple, Jajard explained, they built a pulley that enabled them to mount the sculpture on wooden skids, then lowered it down the steps like a skier on a downhill slope, but at a snail's pace. And if you look at the picture on page 77, it's, that's just an amazing photograph. And that is where they are removing the 6,000 pound, think about that, 6,000 pounds sculpture down the steps of this museum of the Louvre um, in order to take it to a place where it could be preserved. Wormer also wanted to know the fate of the Mona Lisa the most famous painting in the world. La Joconde, Jajard sighed with a smile using the French name of Leonardo's masterpiece. With great satisfaction, he explained how his team had evacuated it on an ambulance stretcher in the dead of night into a waiting van. A museum curator accompanied the masterpiece on its journey. To maintain a stable climate for the painting, the doors of the van were sealed. The painting arrived at its destination safely, but the curator had nearly suffocated. This was just the first of five moves. In the end, it found safety, lying on a floor in Chateau de Montal in southwestern France, inside its custom-made red velvet lined wooden case next to the bed of a 15-year-old girl. The conversation took on a more serious tone when Jajar began describing the challenges of protecting other treasures from the French museums during the four year long Nazi occupation. Realizing the importance the Nazis placed on creating appearance of legality in their transactions, Jajar had converted French bureaucracy into a weapon by waging a paper war to prevent or at least slow to a crawl any effort to steal works of art from the national collections. The strategy for the most part worked. Covert connections with the French resistance, his virtual eyes and ears when tracking German activity also proved important. But there were notable failings, Jajard lamented. While the French museum collections had largely been saved, the Nazis premeditated and systemic 
looting of Jewish owned collections, especially the preeminent dealer collector dynasties, was a loss of immeasurable proportion. Dejard estimated that one third of the French private collections, perhaps as many as 20,000 works of art, were now in Germany. Romer listened as his friend ran down the list of prominent collectors who had been looted, including Rothschild, Rosenberg, and David Will. He knew them all. Unfortunately, so did the Nazis. These enormously rich museum quality private collections contain treasures by all master artists, including Jean Johannes Vermeer and Rembrandt, the great post-impressionist painter Vincent van Gogh and 20th century, century master Pablo Picasso. Museum directors hope someday to acquire them. The Nazis had a simple and more certain plan, just steal them. If you look uh, just briefly at the picture on page 78, so you see that's a map of France. And this is showing what happened when they continue to try to relocate the Mona Lisa um, throughout the war. So you see where it says the Louvre, which is Paris. The Louvre is located in Paris. And it was taken, if you follow the arrow to the left, to Chambord, then up almost to the coast uh, at Utah Beach and the English Channel, then back all the way past down to Laudieu, and then Montauban, and then past the Bordeaux area, and back to Montal, and then ultimately um, back to the Louvre in Paris. But look at that. That five times for that one masterpiece. Amazing. And then um, the top photo, Monuments Man, James Rormer, right, is in front of the wall where Leonardo da Vinci's most famous, payment, pay, famous work, Mona Lisa, once hung. So that's where it had been hanging until it was removed. Okay, back to the bottom of page 79. The initial visit with Jajard was meant to be more of a social call than a briefing session, but Rormer considered it a welcome beginning to his first day of duty as the MFAA Specialist Officer for Paris. As Rorman said his goodbyes, he realized that perhaps only a fellow museum man could fully appreciate Jard's Herculean achievements during the Nazi occupation. Rorman knew that his friend was far too modest to ever lay claim to an act of bravery. But there was no question that Jard was a hero, not just to France, but to all those who loved the arts. Exiting the museum, Rorman passed several U.S. Army tanks packed, parked in the Tuileries Garden a Paris landmark that he believed as worthy of protection as any historic building. The tankers gathered around small fires where they were preparing a hot breakfast and coffee. Others were shaving. Roma wasn't focused on the tanks or the soldiers or possible bullet billeting violations. His thoughts centered on opportunity. Jacques Jujard had provided the monuments men with key information about priceless paintings that the Nazis had stolen from French collectors and then shipped to Germany. He did say one third of the private collections in France, right? Someone had to find those treasures and return them to France. But where to begin? Dejard mentioned that some museum employees had a list of what was stolen and some idea of where it had been taken. But Berlin was still 655 miles away and Romer clearly had his hands full of work in Paris. Still, it wouldn't hurt to dig deeper. Perhaps Dejard would be willing to arrange a meeting with his museum employees. I'm going to stop there at the bottom of page 80 and continue on Monday. Uh, this is a compelling story. Some of you may know there's actually a movie uh, of this book, which I hope we will enjoy uh, once we finish. I always feel like, I don't feel like, I know, it's always best to read the book before you see the movie because when you read the book first, you get it all in your mind, you picture the characters. This book has so many amazing photographs, so you can really see what's happening. Uh, throughout the story, true story. So thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and we'll start on page 80 on Monday. Take care.